Hello, everybody. Thank you for waiting in queue and registering for our webinar. Uh, my name is Faze Tarek, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. So moving on, uh, today's webinar is called Pump It Up, Reducing Costs Through HTPE Pump Stations and Wet Wells. A few housekeeping rules today. If you do experience any loss of audio, simply refresh your page. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box to the right of the presentation widget and ask your question. We may answer your question during the webinar through the chat box, or we'll follow up with you via email. All attendees will receive a one-hour PDH certificate via email. And uh, we do encourage everyone to download our engineered systems brochure available on that same page and discover our other webinars that we've done this year as well. If you are viewing this webinar with a group, please send an email to faiz.tarik, F-A-I-Z dot T-A-R-I-Q at upanor.com, and we'll send all attendees in the room a separate PDH certificate. Now, with that being said, let's look at our uh, speakers today. We have Mr. Grant Thornley, our Sales Director for the North American Infrastructure Division. Grant holds 25 years of experience in the industrial, municipal, and power markets. His experience ranges from pipeline infrastructure rehabilitation to asset management, stormwater, wastewater, water transmission, and finally, pipeline condition assessment. We also have Mr. Trip Waymack. He's a regional sales manager at Upanor in North America. Tripp has 12 years of experience within the industry working with HDP structures, and he currently manages sales for Mid-Atlantic regions for Upanor, which is comprised of Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So our agenda today, uh, Grant will kick it off with an introduction and overview of HDP basics, uh, types of pump stations, engineering design, life cycle cost analysis, buoyancy calculations and countermeasures. We'll look at installation and backfill and some best applications for HDP pump stations and wet wells. And then finally, uh, show you some recent and past projects. So now before we move on, uh, we would like to ask a few poll questions through the audience just to make it a little bit more engaging for us. Um, so the first question will come up on the screen, and then you can select your answer, and we'll collectively look at all the results. And uh, we will idle for about 20, 25 seconds, get everyone a chance to answer, and then move on from there. So you should see it on your screen. So the question is, what is the most common pump station material of construction you have used? Is it concrete, steel, fiberglass, or HDPE? So feel free to uh, select your answer and submit, and then we'll uh, look at the poll results. Okay, so here we go. Here are our results. Uh, what is the most common pump station material of construction you have used? So 68% of you say concrete, and then uh, steel following at 13, fiberglass at 4%, and then HTP at 13, uh, tied with steel. Moving on to our next question. What aspect do you find the most challenging in a pump station project? Is it the design phase, the installation, the shipping and handling, or leak proof testing? So I'll give you about 20 seconds to go ahead and uh, submit your answers for this one, and we'll view the results. Okay, 
So here we are looking at the results. Uh, what aspect do you find the most challenging within your pump station project? And 40% of you said installation. 25 design, leak-proof testing at 30%, and shipping and handling uh, coming, at, coming in at last at 5%. Now with that, uh, we'll start our webinar today, and uh, Grant Thornley will kick us off. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Faze, and uh, thank you very much to, to everyone that uh, has taken time out of their, their busy schedules today I, uh, to, to attend our, our webinar regarding uh, pump stations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just thought uh, I, I'd just kick this off just with a, a quick... Um, uh, overview of kind of who Upanora was, just in case it's the first time you've attended one of our webinars or maybe the first time uh, hearing about uh, Upanor. Um, so who who are we? Well, Upanor. Oh, I. Uh, Upanor, uh, coming uh, by um, uh, in 2018, we will have been celebrating 100 years of manufacturing. Uh, you can see by this slide where we have. Um, I'm going to say unique and, and, and a diverse uh, experience uh, and, and knowledge within the market space ranging from cast iron pipes, PVC pipes, PEX, uh, HDPE. The unique thing is that we've always been focused on piping our infrastructure and it allows us from our, our, our history a very, I'm going to say, unique experience or perspective in the selection of, of materials and understanding the pros and cons of each. Uh, Upanor, as you're probably aware, has, uh, um, uh, has um, uh, focused on and continues to, to put forward HD high-density polyethylene uh, solutions. Uh, and that is manufactured uh, only, uh, Upanor for only manufacturers HDPE today, uh, no longer produces cast iron pipes CVC. So, Upanor at a glance, just Upanor is a global company. Uh, our sales are around $1.1 uh, $1 .1 billion. We operate in about uh, manufacturing 14 sites. Uh, we ha are present within about uh, over 30 countries and employ over about 3,900 people. So just to kind of give you a perspective of, of uh, who Upanor is on a global basis, um, which is good to know because sometimes some of our projects um, may be engineered in North America and the final installation is over in, in Europe. Um, so it's good to know that there's, there's a link between the two and there's consistency uh, between our, our, con uh, our communications as well as, uh, as our product offerings. On a North American basis, which uh, we're, we're more interested in, in, in 2013, uh, you may have known uh, us uh, previously to that as KWH. In 2013, KWH and Upanor merged together, uh, which allowed us, uh, both companies, to leverage their, their industry experience and knowledge um, and allowed us to, to foster uh, new HDPE solution offerings uh, within North America, as well as growing the, uh, our market presence out uh, across uh, the uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, some of you may know us by our, uh, our trade names, uh, which is Sclare Pipe, uh, Whale Gas, Whale Light, uh, Whale Light Reliner. Uh, Sclare Pipe uh, has been available in 19, 1968. It is a solid wall from 34 to 63. Whale Light, which is, and we'll, we'll talk more, that's what our um, pump stations are uh, fabricated from. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. To give you an understanding, the Whale Light is uh, we're able to produce pipe uh, diameters from 18 to 132 inches, uh, and way light pump stations, uh, as I said, uh, to depths of 55 feet. Uh, all of our manufacturing facilities ISO certified, always good to have consistency on your QA and QC, and uh, all of our designs uh, are based off of NSF, FM, or, I'm, or, I'm sorry, certified to NSF, FM, BNQ, ASTM, as well as uh, adhering to uh, industry guidelines and standards on design and practices. So uh, another aspect, just a, a pictorial here, if you see, this is, uh, you see on the left-hand side, this is our solid wall or sclare pipe, typically used in pressure, sometimes non-pressure applications for the conveyance of water and wastewater. Uh, you take a look over here, a pipe which is much, much bigger, which is our structural uh, high-density polyethylene whale light, which we typically use in pipe and pump stations. 
uh, piping. Um, this is the 11 feet in conveyance. We use them in the run of rivers for, for power, uh, for uh, stormwater. Um, but uh, the uniqueness, if you take that pipe and you put it vertically and put caps, a uh, cap and a bottom on it, it becomes a pump station. And that's what we'll be talking about today. And lastly, the structural HDB panels is using the same uh, technology for, for Waylight, but configuring it in a different um, aspect allows us to create panels, uh, Waylight um, structural panels, which can be cut and uh, welded together to create um, uh, buried or above ground structures. And you can kind of see there is a uh, wastewater tank. So the combinations of permutation, uh, permutations of, of solid wall, structural, and the panels uh, allow us to um, use those technologies to create our pump stations. So each one of these, from the solid wall to the structural to, to the structural panels, uh, are used in the creation and fabrication of our pump stations. So just quickly, what is Waylight? Uh, well, Waylight is a, it's a closed profile a structural HDPE beam, uh, which is extruded uh, using uh, thermal plastics, which is the HDPE, um, and can be manufactured essentially any length. As we're extruding it out, uh, it comes to very long lengths, and we can make that from anywhere from a couple of feet to a couple of thousand feet long. Now, the Waylight structural beam can be figured, uh, again, into two unique uh, design configurations, which is our Waylight pipe which is taking that long, uh, as we extrude that close profile structural beam and it comes off the, the extruder, we can then take that um, extruded um, um, structural beam, attach it to a mandrel, and then start in a helical fashion, start winding that and welding the, the interior and exterior, which forms a pipe. And I do have a pictorial uh, picture on that and you'll and make a little bit more sense uh, for people not familiar with the way a light a pipe. And the Waylight structural panels is, is taking that beam as it comes off the line, but rather than um, uh, wrapping it in a helical fashion, what we're going to do is take those beam um, and, and cut it into certain lengths and then weld that into panels. So just to, to give you a, uh, a perspective of what, I'm, uh, what I mean by that is that here is on the, on the left-hand side, this is a, uh, a closed profile uh, structural beam being extruded from, from one of our extruders. Um, you can see it's just coming out straight out, and this becomes, you know, as I said, a couple of feet to uh, a thousand feet coming coming out of the extruder. What we do with that, again, uh, allows us to um, uh, create some unique uh, solution offerings within the industry. On the right-hand side, you can just kind of see what that profile is. You notice that kind of unique, rather than rounded, it, it's camfered uh, edges, and the reason it's camfered is that when we take uh, multiple profiles and we link them or, or um, um, place them next to each other, what we want to do is fuse or weld uh, those structural beams together. So you can see these little uh, black triangles. That represents the HDPE uh, material uh, fusing um, the uh, piping material or the um, structural pro uh, closed profile together. On the left-hand side, you can kind of see this is uh, a pipe being wound. Uh, this is uh, what you see is there's a steel mandrel, and then on the outside is the structural HDPE being wound in a helical fashion. And on the right-hand side is just a different angle of, of the same pipe. You can see it is being wound and coming off the line. Uh, the uniqueness of, of the, um, uh, the way light in, in configuring uh, wrapping uh, using the structural beam is that we can do a pipe that's infinitely long. Uh, really the, the limitations, or I should say the, re, um, the restrictions that we kind of put on the length of the pipe is typically dictated by uh, transportation uh, logistics. Um, so anywhere, the pipe can be anywhere from 45 to, to 50 feet long. We can do longer if, um, uh, if people are willing to pay for additional freight and so on. So um, we have a lot of flexibility in the size, lengths, and configuration of these pipes. So the next configuration is that, as we said, the, that beam's coming off the line, is we can also, rather than wrapping it onto a mandrel to create a pipe, uh, what we do is we um, lash all the um, structural beams together and then we cut them to a certain length. And then from that, the same aspect, uh, as we, they're the same um, technique that we use in creating and manufacturing the way a light pipe, we're going to take those profiles and we're going to fuse them 
uh, to, together. And you can see on the right-hand side, this is an automated uh, panel machine where we have actually stacked uh, the structural beams on top of each other, and it goes through a conveyor, and there's, uh, you can't really see it, but there is uh, extruders um, and, and fusion guns uh, on either side, so it, it completely welds uh, that, the, uh, the panels on one side to another. Uh, the depth is just not a surface, is that the, the weld penetrates deep into it. Um, so the actual weld, because of the amount of material and the density of the material, becomes much actually stronger than the, the physical profile of, of the, um, the, the structural um, um, material itself. So just a quick overview of the characteristics and properties of HDPE. As I said, we've, we use different materials. We've used steel, we use PVC, we've used PEX. And what we've um, um, focused on or settled on uh, through years of experience is HDPE. And just quickly touch on, well, why, why is that? Well, first of all, HDPE is, an, is, is a new product. It's been around since 1933, so it's, it has a very long uh, history. Um, and because of its unique properties, it is, it is widely, widely used material um, throughout infrastructure in North America, Europe, Asia, and so on. It has uh, found a great uh, a market opportunity in which to provide very robust uh, solution offerings uh, at, at better economics than, I'm going to say, traditional or conventional materials. Um, without getting into the, into the chemistry, so it's actually a polymer is you take a monomer, the molecule, and you basically link them all together, but you have thousands if not millions of these monomers linked together to form these very, very long chains, which are um, covalent, um, uh, covalently bonded together, very, very strong bonds. Um, and when you have that material, when you extrude it uh, into an actual product, there's a couple of things that we, we want to um, take a look at, or, or the I'm going to say the three major parameters or factors uh, that dictate the properties, and they are the, the density of the material, um, you know, the denser, so you do have, you can have low density, medium density, high density. We only deal in, in um, high density polyethylene um, offerings uh, because it has uh, uh, the best tensile uh, strength and stiffness uh, out of all the uh, PE materials, or I should say uh, out, out, of, um, out of the PE. Uh, the molecular weight uh, dictates, uh, meaning how long those, those polymer chains are created. Um, represents the durability, and then the molecular weight distribution is sometimes, you know, you, you may have a chain that's, if I can be, um, for, for, for discussion's sake, maybe say a thousand um, uh, molec um, um, monomers long, you may have something that's 500, so sometimes there's, there's a varying length, and that will dictate the molecular distribution. So not to, to get into it, but really that dictates one of the things that we're very interested in is what's the, uh, the stress crack resistance. Uh, meaning that if I was to put this into the ground and I, someone nicks it with a stone or drags it across the construction site, is that going to result in, in, um, in cracking uh, of, of that material? Uh, I'd say probably back in the 1950s, that would be a concern. But with the evolution uh, and the advancements in the PE technology over the years, uh, from, uh, from Dow, from Ineos, and all these other manufacturers, typically located in, in, in the Texas area. Um, resin is just night and day from where it was back in the, in the 1950s to, to today. And part of that is uh, PE3608 or, or bimodal, uh, which is 4710. I won't go into that. You can take a look. There is now a new uh, resin uh, material, which is PERT, which is polyethylene raised temperature, uh, which even gives polyethylene now incredible um, um, features and, and benefits that you hadn't seen in the past. And that, that PERT is a new introduction. Uh, it allows you now to operate um, uh, polyethylene pipe uh, at much, much higher temperatures. It's 180 degrees Fahrenheit now you can operate uh, PE, uh, which was unheard of years ago. So just to give you a little bit of flavor of the advancements that, that have occurred uh, with, within resin. Um, so getting into kind of the, the characteristics and property, one of the really unique things about HDPE is its creep and stress relaxation. And, and what I mean by that is 
you can see on the left hand side uh, what this represents is a temporary stress so it could be you know anywhere from a surge or maybe there is there's a sh um, uh, there's a shift in the ground and that could be because maybe it's a seismic zone uh, maybe that um, the soil has become saturated let's you know, take a look at Texas and unfortunately with the hurricane uh, Harvey I mean the, the water table is up so high is that the original um, installation I'm sure they didn't anticipate a water you know a water table two feet above the ground so sometimes conditions change and when conditions change you want to have a material that's going to be able to react to it properly um, not develop you know it moves and shifts and creates all of a sudden these these stress points and it, it uh, I'm going to say like uh, concrete and all of a sudden it cracks and shatters uh, whereas HDPE, you can see on the left-hand side, if we apply 2,000 pounds, which is an applied stress or force, uh, pulling down on it, and again, it could be through a uh, pipe, a uh, uh, movement within the soil. Um, over time, and this is where you can see T50, you can see that the actual uh, HDP or the, 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 um, the polymer actually moves and stretches and what's occurring is that because it's moving in the direction of that stress it's actually creating it's 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 creeping but it's also uh, reducing that um, trying to reduce the stress applied onto it the other aspect if you release let's say it was a temporary maybe something occurred and then it was fixed later on when you release the force on that what happens or remove the stress is that the HDPE then begins to revert back to its initial state. Now, it's not linear elastic like steel, who would snap back to its original form, but HDPE will retract back um, and, and try to uh, get back to its initial state. So that's a unique thing. Uh, stress relaxation is, is the same thing. What I kind of uh, talked about is that if you put a stress on it, here you see that we have a stress of you know, 12,000 pounds and then over a 50 year or a time period, what happens is because it's moving towards the, the direction of force, it actually starts relaxing. Um, so what does this creep stress relaxation mean? Um, it means this, that if you're in a seismic area or there's a change in your installation, the material has the ability to adapt to its environment. It has the ability to reduce the stresses or strains that are being applied to it, whereas other materials may snap. It hits its fatigue point uh, or, or yield, and it, and it goes. HDPE, um, because of this property, is used extensively in seismic areas. Um, so if you take a look at uh, California or even in um, New Zealand, where they had a uh, huge, like uh, the Churchill uh, area, um, the HDPE pipe that was installed in there survived all those seismic uh, areas, whereas other materials didn't. So, just to give you an understanding of what creep and stress relaxation means and the importance of that. Uh, I won't belabor on that. So, just quickly go through the other aspects. We, we talked about the uh, high density polyethylene is that it, it tolerates freezing without cracking or splitting. Um, so some people have the perception that, oh, you can only install this in the summer when it's warm. No, you can install this all year long, um, as, long as long as you've got workers that are willing to, 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 to bear the cold and, and to install this. Um, if the ductile temperatures mount down to minus 170 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it has a high impact strength and it's high resistant uh, because, again, the ductility and toughness also has a high resistance to surge pressures. Um, not that you typically see that within a, um, uh, within a pump station, uh, but if there was, let's say, all of a sudden the, the, um, maybe the pump doesn't go and it fills beyond the top, um, it's not going to have um, any real issues. Oh, I, I apologize. Someone said that I'm not speaking loud enough. I apologize. Um, you're not going to have um, uh, any issues with uh, surge pressures be because of the material. Duct oh, sorry about that. Um, and what I mean by that is the elongation. We, we kind of talked about or touched on that on, on the um, uh, creep and uh, stress. Uh, the high tensile strength. Uh, again, it is not steel linear elastic, but you can see what, what we're doing here is we're actually testing the weld. Uh, so in the top section and bottom section is when we talked about, remember, the two profiles coming together and we fuse that. 
What we do in our QA and QC lab uh, for any product that we manufacture, we take a representative sample, this would create a dog bone, and then we put it into a tensile machine and we, we stretch it to see if it's uh, right to its yield point. And typically what you find, or I'm going to say, you know, 99.9% .9 is what you find is that it will snap, it will, it will yield and snap at the actual material, but not at the, um, the, the fused uh, uh, welds which is a, a very critical component when we do QAQCs uh, on our pump stations. It has very high compressive strength, um, which is great because sometimes when we put pump stations in, we have foot traffic, but we also may have uh, HS20, HS25 uh, vehicle traffic loading. It has high abrasion rate um, for materials coming through. Just on, on um, It has one of the lowest abrasion rates out of all the materials from concrete, clay, PVC. Um, that's why PVC is used extensively in mining applications. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's just an example of, um, uh, of a concrete uh, pipe surface that's been exposed to, um, uh, to abrasion, and you can see the aggregates being exposed there. The other aspect for chemical and corrosion, for you know, specifically for pump stations, is that you, you never know when, what's coming down the, the pipe, so to speak. Um, and it could be someone dumped maybe a low pH or maybe a high pH or soaps and so on. Um, you don't know. So HCP is very unique because it has the ability to withstand high or low pH excursions from uh, pHs of, you know, 2 to all the way up to 14. Um, it's unaffected by hydrogen sulfide in case you ever get into a stagnant situation, maybe the pumps go or whatever, and, and there's the, the formation of hydrogen sulfide. Um, and if you've ever been through pipes and you take a look at, typically it's the crown area that dissolves through, so this thinning of the wall. With HDPE, it's completely inert and unaffected by hydrogen sulfide. The other aspect, just quite simply, is HDPE is not a metal. So if it's not a metal, it can't corrode. And that's, you know, part of these for the chemical, uh, the hydrogen sulfide, and uh, the non-corrosive nature of it, that's what really, um, that supports and allows us uh, to provide 100-year design lives within our pump stations. So the type of pump stations, um, as you're aware, uh, dry wells, uh, there's also a suction lift, as you can see on the, the right-hand side here, and uh, submersible. Um, and this one is a submersible with a, with a valve vault off to the side. So just to let you know is that we're able to um, uh, manufacture and fabricate uh, any, uh, really any configuration uh, or any design requirements that you have, uh, whether it's, it's a dry suction or, or a submersible. Uh, application. On the engineering design, uh, we try to provide as much information. You know, it's um, an educated client is the best client of ours. So what Upanor has done, we've developed uh, an online calculator to kind of help you along uh, your design. So, of course, you can always uh, talk to a representative um, uh, of Upanor to to help work the design. But if you feel feel um, uh, uh, required to, to take a look at, maybe do your own calculations, or maybe um, do some modeling on your own, feel free to go to the online calculator and you can take a look at the, the um, uh, different inputs in order to help you calculate your, uh, uh, do some calculations to ensure your design is going to meet the requirements of your application. So part of what we do on the engineering design is a structural analysis. Um, we've been doing pump stations for a while. We do have standard designs, but you know sometimes you do get into uh, areas that people say, "Hey, maybe I have some unique um, uh, backfill uh, uh, backfill. Uh, I want to use native fill." Uh, it could be, you know, in, in some instances we've we've had people say we want to go down 60 feet, 65 feet, 70 feet deep. Um, some some uniquenesses. Well, our, our engineering group or engineering service group within Uponor has the ability uh, to model up uh, your design. So we can take our t standard design, we, we can modify that, or we can create a new design uh, using a Candy, which is a 2D, uh, two-dimensional uh, planar uh, pump station analysis and design, and, and Inventor, uh, which is our, um, our engineering uh, software for uh, finite element analysis. Typically what, what you're seeing uh, on the right-hand side here is here is a, um, uh, a relief, a uh, top of a pump station with relief. And what we're doing, because this is going to be uh, vehicle, um, vehicle uh, traffic, H HS20, 
uh, what we've done is we run it, have run it through our uh, FEA analysis. You can see, uh, you know, hey, we've we've got all the blue is good, but we've got a little bit of a, a red spot right there. So what we're going to do through our fabrication, we're going to um, stiffen that up uh, with with another stiffener. So that allows us to quickly to to run through modeling and ensure that the pump station design will we give you, we know it's going to um, um, meet all the expectations because we've done the modeling to it. Uh, another aspect, so that was um, the, the top, and now we're looking at the base uh, of the pump station. Um, sometimes you get, uh, it could go into areas with a high water table, uh, which will exert uh, forces uh, upward forces, and I believe uh, triple talk to, to buoyancies, but upward forces which we need to address. And, and by running through uh, our FEA analysis, by understanding what the water table is, or uh, if we don't have that worst case scenario, what do we need to design this to? So again, uh, additional tools in which to ensure uh, the design integrity that we're putting forward to you. And one answer would be before uh, um, Tripp um, gets into his presentation, I thought, you know, uh, life cycle costs. You know, one of the uniqueness to H, uh, H, uh, high density polyethylene is that it does have the lowest life cycle cost in, in the market today. And what I mean by low, uh, life cycle cost is the total cost of ownership. So not the, just the capital expenditure, which most people focus on, but what is the total cost of ownership over the life or the design life of that um, um, uh, offering or, or product? And when you take a look at the, the total cost of ownership of HDPE versus other materials, it becomes very apparent um, why HDPE is being embraced in, in the market um, through municipal industrial uh, at a very, very high r uh, rate of engagement. Um, I was at a conference last year at the Underground uh, Engineering Solutions. And uh, what, what the, they, out of a poll of around 75 municipalities, what you saw is that there was a higher engagement of polymer, um, which is, includes uh, HDPE, at a, at a growth rate of around 30, 37, 38% over conventional materials. So uh, there's more and more of an, an embracing of HDPE as, as a solution offering than other materials. Um, and why this just this is just a very simple uh, life cycle cost calculation. So there's more complex ones, but just to give you an understanding of what we mean by life cycle cost, that when you take a look at the initial cost, and in this particular instance, is I purposely said, okay, HDPE, these are just ballpark numbers for 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 discussion sakes only. But let's say a, a pump station is um, out of HDP is $110,000 versus a comparable design of concrete with 100. Well, you might say, hey, I can, I can save $10,000 for going in concrete. But if we take the dollars per year for operations, for maintenance, uh, and we understand that, you know, HDPE is chemical resistant, it's hydrogen sulfide, you know, um, uh, resistant. It, it is non -cor it's non-corrosive. But if we take a look at concrete, well, concrete dissolves in low pHs. Concrete spalls. Concrete's a porous material. The steel inside the concrete, which allows, which provides... Um, which is a composite, which provides the strength, the tensile strength to the concrete, because concrete's great in compression but not good in tension, that steel is going to rust. And when that steel rusts and snaps, it loses the integrity. So there is maintenance. Um, it could be every two years or four years, but you're going to see a higher maintenance cost for operations um, and, and dollars applied to concrete than HDPE. So very simplistically, I said, hey, what, what if we said a, a dollar per year for, uh, on operations for uh, HTP5 for concrete? And if you work it all out and we take a look at the, the, the design life, at 100 years, you've spent $110 and $200. And at that same time, uh, time frame, you've spent an additional $100,000. So in, in relation, you know that you're going to be spending more money on the operations and maintenance. Uh, of of a concrete or other material versus HDPE. In 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 that, um, um, I'd like to conclude and um, turn over the presentation uh, to Trip now. Take it away, Trip. All right, thank you, Grant, very much uh, for that, and um, thanks again for everybody for attending. So I'm going to start by addressing just some of the uh, topics of major concerns for. for uh, that we get, uh, questions that we get. I'm going to try and answer those and, and address those. Uh, first and foremost, buoyancy. I always get questions about buoyancy. 
Um, but second, uh, we get questions about insulation and backfill. And, um, and then I'm going to talk to you about some of the projects, um, uh, some example projects that we've done. And while I do that, I'll talk to you about some of the applications that we feel are best fit, um, where, where this is uh, a perfect material where nothing, um, no other material on the market can really compete as far as uh, the benefits that we provide. So um, first, uh, we'll start with buoyancy. So in buoyancy countermeasures, there's uh, two two ways uh, we have to we have to talk about this. So one is in a horizontal application, and the other is in a vertical application. Most pump stations we do with vertical wet wells, um, addressing buoyancy is really an easy thing to do. And here's a, a slide that basically describes this uh, very simple calculation. Buoyancy is just the uh, the volume, the weight of the water displaced, um, the volume of water displaced, the weight of that water is the uh, minus the, the weight of the structure. And um, and the way we counteract that is by putting a base plate on it. Uh, the Because our wet wells are very light, and in, keep in mind, everything, even concrete wet wells, will float. But because ours are very light, uh, people tend to think they, uh, they, they have, we have more of an issue with that. And in fact, we don't. Uh, we address it the exact same way. And on the bottom of our stations, we, we have a base plate. And uh, that base plate is just size. Uh, so that the shear load of the soil on that base plate is enough to counteract that upward buoyant force. And when we do these calculations, um, uh, we we always take into account a, uh, a safety factor. And no matter what uh, a geotech may tell us uh, about the water table, we like to assume a worst case scenario, which is that the water is at grade and um, that we have a completely empty vessel. So. And unless we're given any other direction, we always put a, a, a safety factor of at least 1.25. Now, ultimately, the consulting engineer gets to decide if they would like a, a more of a safety factor or not. And, and oftentimes, we have clients who will prefer to have a concrete collar no matter what, because we really don't want to change the way things, the, you know, the things are done. If you have concrete collars on all your existing concrete or fiberglass stations, that's fine. We can accommodate that, and and if you're going to do that, we'll help you size the concrete collar, and it also allows us to reduce the size of our base. We really don't need all that plastic and steel reinforced reinforcement if we're going to have a concrete collar. All we really need is enough plastic to to grab that concrete and make the concrete uh, have enough surface area to, to again catch that shear load of the soil. So here's a a quick uh, picture of, uh, of our calculator. It's very easy for us to do these calculations by hand, but we have this handy dandy calculator that we use to uh, plug in the, the dimensions of the wet well and it calculates the weight. And if there's any concrete inside the station, uh, the weight of the pumps are taken into account. And, uh, and then it tells us the safety factor at the end. And then you see a little picture there of a, uh, of a concrete collar being poured. That's a reinforced concrete collar. That's not always necessary. Oftentimes on smaller vessels, they just pour the concrete directly into the hole. Uh, no, no form needed. It's a very simple operation. And usually it's less, it's no more than one to three yards of concrete. Uh, so aside from the vertical vessels and horizontal vessels, we address it in a completely different way. Um, the calculation is the same, but the uh, method to, to keep the vessel in the ground under any condition is used with a dead man system. Now, we will calculate the size of the concrete dead man uh, that the contractor can pour, or we can provide a system uh, that ships along with the system, along with your vessel. Um, we will calculate uh, how, not only how big the concrete dead men need to be, but we will also calculate uh, how many galvanized steel straps that are needed for a horizontal vessel, the width of those straps, and the spacing of those straps. We will provide all the hardware associated with that should the contractor want to cast those in place, which we do feel is the usually the most cost-effective solution. However, if you have a really tight project schedule, uh, we are willing to um, to create a concrete uh, dead man to ship alongside the vessel. And here's a, a picture of one thing that we can do uh, along those lines is because we also manufacture solid wall pipe, we can take a solid wall pipe and embed the anchor hardware in it and fill it with concrete uh, and ship it right next to your vessel and have it ready to be dropped in the hole uh, and, and you can be backfilling within minutes of this thing arriving on site. So 
So uh, we call it a WAO anchor. So now uh, the next thing I want to talk about is backfill standards. We do get a lot of questions about insulation, and and just so you know, part of my job as a regional uh, manager for Upanor is also in project management duties. I like to be on site whenever I can, uh, whenever I do have a pro a, a structure shipped. Um, but I also suggest that um, you have a geotech on site. Um, everything you need to know about backfilling and installation of HDPE structures is described and defined by ASTM D2321. And this is a, uh, a standard that talks about uh, flexible structures, okay, flexible uh, thermoplastic pipe. And the thing about flexible thermoplastic pipe is that it interacts with the soil around it. So the backfill material and the backfill procedure is very, very important. It's only as good as the material around it and, and how well it was installed. So a um, couple of pictures here that I'll show you. One is uh, this, these two pictures show the critical backfill zone uh, for a horizontal vessel, zones A and zones B. Um, one thing I want to point out is it shows uh, a proper layback for a hole like this. You will have to compact um, up and under. You'll have to push the material. Uh, class one or class two backfill material up under the haunches of the vessel and compact and six to eight inch lifts to 90% proctor. So uh, you will have to have proper layback for the hole. So I always like to show people this picture. Uh, but zone A is class one or class two. Zone B is class three material. We will define just how far from the, uh, the, the OD of the vessel that zone A needs to extend. But again, D2321-14 defines what class one, class two, and class three materials are, and that class uh, one and class two are for zone A, and zone B is class three material. So um, again, uh, I like to make sure that uh, you try and have your geotech on site for this. Um, I hate to say it, but contractors have been known to bait and switch uh, material. Contractors have been known to um, you know, try and, and, and make claims that, uh, you know, 57 stone is self-compacting. Uh, nothing is self-compacting. Um, that is not sufficient. We, we like to, uh, make sure that, um, we are getting confirmation of compaction using a nuclear penetrometer, uh, calibrated. And, uh, again, that everything is compacted to 90% proctor. So, uh, this is all defined for you. And we also provide, um, installation manuals with all of our systems as well. So again, uh, some key points here, geotech of record to confirm that the, uh, the native soil has at least 2000 PSF. Um, we're, we're meeting 2321 and we're compacted in accordance to 2321. So, and if needed, geotech style. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you now a little bit uh, about some of our uh, some of our favorite projects that we've done that really speak to the level of complexity of what we're able to achieve with these types of structures. And, and also I'll talk to you about some other applications that aren't shown here uh, that I think are, are a perfect fit that we've really found a lot of success in, in helping our clients with these types, these difficult types of applications. So the first project that I'll talk to you about is in downtown LA. This is for the LA Federal Courthouse. And this is actually a rainwater harvest system, but it has an adjacent pump station, and the reason why I'm showing you this is because this is one of the, the best configurations, the best uses of our material to really get the most out of, uh, out of your, your working volume here. And I'll, I'll go ahead and skip some of these details to show you uh, this 3D graphic of the system. This is a 150 foot long, 11 foot diameter uh, storage vessel. Um, if we were to drop a pump directly down into that horizontal vessel, you would lose up to two or more feet of that working volume just for pump submergence. So what we found is it makes a lot more sense to build a, an adjacent vertical wet well uh, and make it a couple feet below so that you really do take full advantage of all of that working volume. And, and this is also a good example because uh, a lot of municipalities, especially in Florida that I'm that I'm talking to now are starting to require 24 hours of storage 
in each pump station, adjacent to each pump station. And this is a perfect way of doing that uh, and keeping the cost down. So this is something that uh, if your clients are interested in um, or if you're interested in, uh, we, we have an excellent approach to, to that type of challenge. So here's another picture uh, showing the uh, L.A. courthouse. Uh, pump station is a very small wet well. Uh, we didn't need a large bottom. Uh, there weren't a lot of, you know, on, on small structures, we don't have a, a lot of buoyant force, so we don't have to worry about deflection on the, ba on the base of the, of the structure. Um, so this is not an expensive wet well uh, in comparison to, uh, to other, uh, other technologies or other materials of construction. And it, it all shows up in one piece. That is probably uh, one of my favorite uh, things about what we do with these uh, uh, HDPE structures is everything is prefabricated. It is really a plug-and-play approach. Um, there, there are lots of advantages to uh, and time and money uh, savings when you have a, a structure that shows up on a truck ready to put in the hole. And here's a perfect example of that, this West Branch pump station in Montgomery, Pennsylvania. This is a 30-foot deep, 11-foot diameter whaleite structure that um, once this showed up on site, it was in the hole within 30 minutes from the truck to the hole, and they're already starting to backfill within 30 minutes. Uh, that's something that, you know, cannot be said about any other material um, especially concrete that is put in in sections and each joint has to be sealed. Um, any, any kind of hopper bottoms or anything that needs to be grouted in, pump shelves, things like that. Um, and those are the types of applications where we really shine. Uh, we have the ability to make any kind of hopper bottom, any kind of shape. Uh, custom applications are where, are where we can uh, provide the most advantage. Uh, anything that you know, you might have to, any complex shape that you might have to make with concrete, uh, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time on site. If you have a big, deep hole that you're trying to work in, that's more time in the hole. That's that's a safety issue as well. You also have more dewatering costs. You have more equipment rental costs. You have, um, you know, you have to shore up the hole and all those uh, trench boxes and things cost a lot of money to to keep on site for weeks on end. Uh, with our system, uh, again, as soon as you dig the hole and drop this thing in, you can uh, you can be up and running in in a matter of a day. So uh, we we will include uh, in, built into the system will be the discharge elbows, will be the guide rails, will be everything but the pumps themselves, and the contractor will just have to run the electrical and hook up his panel and, and drop the pumps down on the rails, and they're ready to go. But this uh, this installation right here was a quadplex. It was a very interesting structure. We I've, got, I've included a couple pictures to show you the construction of the base. Uh, the concrete base is there not for ant, uh, count, counter buoyancy. Um, it is there for uh, to absorb the vibratory loads of the pump and to resist deflection on the bottom of the vessel. The anchor bolts are embedded into the concrete. And, and uh, another question that I get asked often is what happens if we break a bolt or if we want to change the pattern here? And it's the exact same way you would handle it with a concrete station. You would have to uh, remove the bolt and then put the new bolt in place with epoxy. If you were going to uh, do a completely different pump, then you would want to saw these off and probably move it over an inch or two so that you don't have to, uh, you know, put the bolts in the exact same place, uh, that would be difficult, but uh, there's really no difference in your procedures here in our stations with concrete other than there's a lot less maintenance. There's no, there's nothing to check, there's nothing to clean. So another installation that uh, that, that really shows an excellent application for, for this material is at the Denver airport. Uh, we did 16 manholes here. I know this isn't a pump station per se, but it applies very well here because they had, um, significant levels of hydrogen sulfide and then glycol and these stations that they had weren't lasting 12 to 15 years whereas uh, the HDP sol HDPE solution is going to last for uh, in excess of 100 years and these stations are still in, in use of course today and uh, and this really solved uh, a big problem for Denver and their return on investment is really hard to calculate when when they're having to replace uh, pump stations every 15 years or manholes every 15 years. It is, it is impossible to calculate how much money we will have saved them over the course of a 100-year lifespan of this pump, uh, these wet wells. So 
couple other things that I'm going to talk to you about. One, uh, um, this this shows uh, some uh, horizontal applications. This is a project that is not yet in the ground, but I wanted to mention it because, again, it speaks to the level of complexity that we're able to achieve using this material. This, this pump station, I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it is a U.S. Army industrial sewer project. Um, industrial applications um, are really an ideal fit. Any kind of highly corrosive, highly abrasive, um, really extreme pHs, um, those types of things lend itself to the use of HDPE, and that's why we were selected and basically sole sourced for this project. They, they wanted no other material involved. These are all 11-foot diameter structures, uh, some, and there's nine of them total. There will be three phases of this project over the next couple of years. Um, we have horizontal pump stations and, and valve vaults um, with vertical turbine pumps, very large risers that are uh, at least 15 feet uh, in, in height. Uh, so that makes the bottom of this vessel um, over 25 feet into the ground. Uh, the comparable concrete structure that they started designing this project with would uh, have been millions upon millions of dollars and a very, uh, very tight site as well, uh, deep in the heart of some mountains uh, around West Virginia. And, and that's something that, that would have taken this, they would have tripled the length of the project of the installation of each one of those stations. We were able to, to cut the costs by uh, one, at least one-tenth of what the total project cost would have been using concrete. So this is an excellent application for us. It's going to lead to a lot more military projects for us. And, 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 and it's an excellent example of the use of material. So along those lines, some other, um, some other applications, industrial applications, of course, but landfill leachate is a very, very harsh environment, a very, very harsh liquid that uh, can, can have all types of contaminants that you really, it's, it's very difficult to define. And so for that reason, uh, a material like HTPE covers everything. It covers any type of contaminant that you might have. And, and we found that uh, it has been excellent for storing uh, leachate. If you want lots of detention volume, lots of uh, hydraulic retention volume, then you can do that uh, using a horizontal vessel with a vertical uh, pump station. We're replacing leachate ponds with, you know, several hydraulically linked horizontal vessels and one vertical uh, wet well with a, with a duplex pump station. Um, in addition, uh, things like um, wastewater treatment plants, high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide gas. Wastewater treatment plants are at the end of the line. So in areas where you have low velocities, really low-lying areas, very flat areas with lots of pump stations, you have low velocities. Um, coastal areas, and especially in my territory in the southeast where you have um, you have uh, warmer temperatures. This all is, it makes it a much better environment for the bacteria that that uh, that creates this hydrogen sulfide, and and that it it can just destroy uh, all the all the concrete stations, um, and and we are completely unaffected by that. So coastal areas, low lying areas, uh, flat areas with low velocities uh, have really high concentrations of high hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, we've been very successful in Florida for that reason, and, and we're moving up the East Coast. We've done installations for Walt Disney World, Amelia Island. We have uh, countless installations now uh, up and down the, the coast, and, and it's an excellent fit. Uh, we'd like to eventually move towards the Gulf and provide those advantages to, to areas uh, experiencing the same types of issues. So here's another picture uh, of, of another of the pump stations, uh, the horizontal vessels uh, where you have vertical turbine pumps in one of the vessels, and then on the other two are really just there for storage, but they're all hydraulically linked. Everything here is HDPE. Um, you know, they didn't want any, even stainless steel. There are um, nitrous, nitro cotton and toluene and some other uh, really – uh, terrible solvents, uh, uh, along with a lot of grit. Um, so this is a perfect application for HDPE. And also, going back to wastewater treatment plants, um, there are a lot of aspects of a wastewater treatment plant where we can provide benefit. Um, if you have membranes and they need to be backwashed with chemicals, that's an ideal. Uh, you have high and low pHs, um, uh, hypochlorite, and um, 
and citric acid. Those are all used uh, on MBR applications. Um, those are excellent uh, applications for us. Any kind of um, uh, stages of the treatment process where you have high chemical concentration or really highly corrosive uh, chemicals like uh, ferric sulfide or ferric chlorate. Um, Headworks is an ideal uh, uh, application for us because there are such high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide gas. We can do distribution boxes, grit chambers. We can uh, do complete structures to house screens. Uh, those are all ex excellent applications for us. So I think that's about it. Uh, I want to thank everybody, and I'll turn it back over to, to Faze to close this out. Thank you, Tripp, and uh, that brings us to the end of our pump station webinar. Hope you enjoyed and absorbed the content. Uh, this is one of our last webinars for the year, but we'll be back in 2018 with more content and updates, so we hope to see you again. Uh, please expect your PDH certificates within a few days, and <clears throat> on behalf of myself, Tripp, Grant, and Upanor, I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day.